welcome to today's episode of Making the Jump, a video series about innovation and digital higher education. Or perhaps we should say a video series about digital innovation in higher education. Either way, it's going to work itself out. My name is Justin Hotson, and I'm your series host, and I'm really excited about today's episode because I'm being joined by a good friend of mine, Dr. April O'Brien, and we're going to talk about all things digital, digital literacy, digital creativity, and even digital scholarship as we both employ digital technologies in our own scholarly practices. Dr. O'Brien is an assistant professor of technical communication at Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas, where she teaches undergraduate and graduate courses ranging in focus from document design to their introduction to technical communication course. She regularly has students working in and across digital creative platforms, helping to sort of heighten their understandings of how communication and rhetoric and digital technologies all relate to one another and help create meaning in a sort of 21st century communicational landscape. Beyond her many talents as an educator and scholar, however, Dr. O'Brien is also a digital literacy thought leader for Adobe, where she regularly helps uh, teachers and educators across the country and even sometimes outside the country uh, see the potential of bringing digital creativity in the classroom and helps them develop skills and practices for employing digital literacies in their own pedagogy. So I can't think of a better inaugural guest for our show. So with that, we want to welcome April O'Brien in today to our inaugural episode. Is there anything I left out in the introduction? Anything you want to say to the viewers that you think they should know about you before we get started? I think you got everything. I I can't imagine anything else. I do forget a lot of things, so it's possible, <laughs> right? Uh, okay, so, you know, to provide a little bit of, a, of, a, of an opening, I mean, digital literacy means so many things to so many people, and digital creativity has a sort of a large spectrum of concepts, and so maybe it would be helpful if we kind of establish some grounds on like what we mean when we talk about digital literacy. Um, so I see digital literacy and digital creativity digital creativity um, in separate contexts, so I guess I will talk about them separately, too. Um, and then I, I also break down digital literacy, particularly in the classroom, in two different tracks as well. Um, so in the classroom, um, digital literacy, um, it takes two different potential tracks. Um, in one track, it is, I always see teaching, especially because of the fact that I, I primarily teach students who are not English majors, they're not rhetoric or writing majors. Um, they're usually um, coming to a class, a, a technical writing class, uh, writing in the profession, something like that, where I'm giving them a set of tools that they're going to use in their future profession. So with that in mind, I see digital literacy as an opportunity to show them just the wide range of potential that is out there to give them some practical skills um, that are going to help them in their future jobs. So when I talk about digital literacy, I talk about um, communicating with infographics. I talk about communicating with making a podcast, um, with making a website. Um, there's so many different ways to persuade, um, to, to adapt our message depending on um, who we're communicating to and that sort of thing. And I'm always plugging this. Having digital literacy is something that's going to get you a job. Having digital literacy is something that's going to make a future employer say, wow, this person has the skill set in addition to the content knowledge that they have in this field, um, which I think is imperative in 2019. And then the other end of it, I think, I would have to say the other end of it probably is linked more towards digital creativity. It's that inner creativity that I see all students, all individuals having in a different capacity. Um, so because of the kind of students that I teach, they are not accustomed to you know, having a professor ask them to um, create graphics, you know, they're not, they're not used to having to make videos. They're not used to having to use these technologies to communicate some kind of message. So again and again, every semester, different universities, I keep hearing the same thing. Hey, I didn't know that I had this creative side to me and I really like this. And I didn't even think of myself in those terms. I thought, digital creativity or creativity in general was just for artists and architects and you know people who can do things that I can't do but then I found hey I like making videos I'm good at this um, and so I've seen my students tap into that potential as well and um, it's exciting to hear them say that they've gotten something out of this class that they'll be able to use again and again and so digital creativity to me is I've always seen it as being in the zone. I used to run and I remember when I would run longer distances and it would feel almost as if I wasn't running anymore. I wouldn't feel the pain. I wouldn't really even notice my surroundings. It was just like this, you're there, you're in that moment. And 
um, I found that that zone for me when I was editing videos. Um, and it was like the world around me stopped. I was sitting in front of a computer for eight hours. I didn't even notice what was happening. So I think that digital creativity is being in the zone where you're tapping into this inner potential to see things and communicate in new ways. Um, and it looks different for everyone. It's kind of fluid and flexible. I'm with you. I think one of the, the, the best parts about the digital tools is that they uh, really empower people to find creative outlets that they may not have known were, were there. Or in, and like in some of the cases when we work with Adobe, um, some of their tools just make creativity so much easier to do because they're built in, you know, quality principles of design and, and, and engagement. And so it sort of helps facilitate that. So I think that's uh, a really great way of thinking about, you know, how we do what we do or some of the ways we can bring that stuff into the classroom. You also mentioned um, the importance of how these things translate to uh, the, the work world, right? And I was having this conversation a few weeks back about, you know, marketing and, and the digital corporate America and, you know, um, the digital creative side and digital literacy side is actually one of the core skills now tied to communication that mm -hmm. employers look for. So not only are you able to verbally communicate uh, and uh, communicate in written form, but can you communicate across different kinds of media? So the, given that in framework, um, what are some ways in which that, uh, that you bring maybe some digital literacy or digital creativity things into the classroom specifically like you know what do you what are, your, what are some of your go-to tricks and trades or what are some of your basic uh, what, what must you accomplish in each class those kinds of things I always have my students um, play around with various different ways to communicate their research so I introduce them They're, they've always used PowerPoint that's what everybody has always used yeah um, most of them say, I've never even thought about using anything else besides PowerPoint. And then usually PowerPoint is done with bullet points on a slide, maybe a really hard to read graph, something like that. Um, and so I, I introduce to them Microsoft Sway. I teach them story maps from ArcGIS. Um, we play around with Spark um, Page. Um, and then we also do PowerPoint and or Keynote, uh, which is Max version of it. And um, I, I just introduced possibilities into the, into, the, into the mix. And what happens when I show students, these are ways that you can communicate your ideas that are beyond just the same old, same old. Um, I've had students say, this is amazing. I never thought about you know, making a presentation do this and make all of these things happen at the same time. And now I'm using this in another class. And then I had another student say, hey, I used this and got this job. Yeah. I have an internship. So, I mean, for me, I'm like, wow, this is tangible skills that I'm giving to my students that they can use in their real life. So it's awesome. You know, I do the same thing with podcasting classes, uh, but, but the, actually a similar approach in terms of this multitude of, of options for students. So, you know, we do cover Adobe Audition because IU is a, Indiana University where I'm at is a creative campus. We have the creative cloud, Adobe Creative Cloud suite available for all of our students. Um, but I also introduced them to uh, Audacity, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sort of free version and show them how that works. Uh, many of them, I let them work in uh, GarageBand to edit things. Yeah. Uh, and we'll have discussions in class after a couple of intros to like, you know, what are the affordance of these different programs? How do they work? And it's amazing. They've never worked in, many of them have never worked in audio before either, you know, because the kind of classes that we teach. Um, but it, uh, just having that conversation and showing them those possibilities mm -hmm. really starts to open up how they think about what they're trying to accomplish. And I think the same is true, right? When you teach keynotes and um, PowerPoint and then, you know, Prezi or whatever else you're, you're moving across. And, and I didn't even think about story maps and, I mean, geez, that's a lot of options. Um, and Spark Page, yeah. of course, and the way it rolls. And mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I'm, I'm going to start adding this to my list now because I, I do we do Spark Page and I'll show them, you know, some things with PowerPoint, how to hack PowerPoint to make it do and perform in ways that it's not supposed to, you know, animations and things like that. But I mean, well, I shouldn't say it's not supposed to. It was built as an animator's tool. But, um, but right, you know, but it's, he uses it that way. People right, know it's, the same yeah, way. It's, I don't know. Like, why not? Why not do something different with it? I don't know. It's like somebody <laughs> decided. You know, this is a great option to paste paste a note card on. Like, <laughs> someone had that thought at some point in time. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, but I think this is. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna steal this. Just so you know, I'm gonna bring these things in and be like, okay, here's your smorgasbord of presentational tools. Yes. Um, and here's the different ways in which they might operate. Let's see how they might work best for you. So that's that's yeah. great. Um, you know. Uh, so what? My question. So then, when you have students working, is do they then make things with them, or is it just yeah. like? Is it a specific assignment or, I mean, cause for me it would be, we're going to do digital storytelling or digital narratives. Can you do it in PowerPoint? I mean, I'm not sure that would be the right platform, uh, right. but it could, it could work that way. Particularly the, 
uh, the out, output as HTML file form for, for PowerPoint. But so what, 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 do you, what do you have them working on when they're working on those uh, projects? Um, so I, I scaffold it. Uh, probably somewhere early to mid-semester, we talk about lightning talks as a genre. Um, that there'll be times where they'll have to give, I mean, there's various different kinds of talks. Um, you might have an impromptu type talk where you have to just talk off the cuff, but then there's, you know, a lightning talk where you have to communicate an idea and you have like three to five minutes to do it. So prior to that, we talk about using Keynote or PowerPoint and having one slide do multiple functions without having to click. Um, and, you know, I will, I'm going to share my screen right now. Just yeah, go ahead. Because I have, um, let me get rid of this. There it is. Okay. Um, this is a presentation that I just gave at a conference just this past weekend. So I'm just going to play this slide yeah, and then show you what I'm talking about. So I, I teach them how to have one slide do multiple functions. So as you're talking, you're not feeling like you have to click, click. or worry about when the click is going to happen. But yet your audience isn't bored just looking at a static image of, bullet points, or as I've mentioned before, very difficult to read graphics, which is a real <laughs> popular genre of presentations. Yes, um, yes, so yes. I teach them how to have images come in and out and have you know changes with opacity and then text come up. Um, and so for a lightning talk, they have to pick a concept in their field that they want to communicate to an audience that's unfamiliar with that concept in three to five minutes. Um, so I have had students, I had a math student um, give this really beautiful uh, five minute talk about the most, and he called this the most beautiful equation in the world. And I don't remember what the Boyle's law, something. I mean, I am not a math person. I have no idea, but he gave this beautiful talk um, that was so inspiring. And he used um, Keynote, I believe it was Keynote that he used in this amazing way where, like you see on the screen here, he's talking about concepts that are important to him and communicating them in, in a way that makes sense to an audience that's not familiar. Simultaneously, he is making Keynote or PowerPoint work for him in a way that is not traditionally um, been used. I really felt like Buffalo was going to swallow me. Like it kept getting closer <laughs> and closer. And I was like, man, I'm, I'm feeling a little smothered at the moment. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Uh, which is great. I, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. You know, talk, I talk about the importance of motion in, particularly when I teach like a public speaking class or whatever, uh, you know, motion in your visual aids to create movement and engagement and, um, but not too much motion because we don't want roller coaster right. sickness, you know. Or erratic motion. I'm, I always tell them speed, think about the speed in which things are happening. You don't want it to be quick motion or then the person right. is staring at the screen and not listening to you speak. So the slow, kind of the slow motion Things are happening, yeah. but it's not taken away from what you're saying. Um, so then that is the, the beginning, middle of semester. And then at the end of the semester, after we've you know, worked through multiple different projects, um, incorporating concepts from their field, they'll do you know, a long like conference type presentation, you know, a 15 minute talk, um, communicating some kind of ethical or social justice related issue in their field you know, they've done research, yeah. they've written about it, and then they're using any of the modes that, or any of the platforms we've talked about. So I give them the option of using story maps, of using um, Microsoft's way, any of these, but I want them to do something new, fresh, innovative with it. Um, so no stale PowerPoint. And they can use right. PowerPoint, it just has to be new and exciting. Right, right, right. So, no, it's, uh, it reminds me very much, uh, you know, so when I was at Clemson as a grad student, I designed a class called Professional Rhetorics. And I had the same 18 students in a three, three credit hour public speaking class and a three credit hour business writing class. So those 18 students unfortunately had me for six hours a week, right? Which is way more me than anyone wants. <laughs> um, but we, we split it. So it was like uh, two thirds on writing for professional environments, two thirds on speaking for professional environments and mm -hmm. two thirds uh, on, you know, um, um, making media for professional environments, uh, which equals six thirds. And I know, but it was two classes. So that counts. Math works mm -hmm. out. Um, and it was fascinating to see how they would do these sort of really rich research based orientations, leverage those tools and those modes to create presentations and you know so I, I think your your model is great I, it was one of the more rewarding classes uh, or classes mm -hmm. that I ever taught uh, I haven't found that option since then but uh, it's a great you know, that. yeah, that that class. that's great it was, it was intense though I, I've told them up front like listen I don't even I don't even hang out myself for this many credit hours a week so you know I can't imagine what it's like to be 
and you know have me for three hours on Tuesday and three hours on Thursday. That was just way too much. I would imagine um, you really got to know each other pretty well. We did. I think I wrote recommendation letters for like half that class at some mm -hmm. point. Um, so it was a really, it was a great experience, but yeah, you know, I'm always sympathetic to students and their exposure to me talking about the things that I'm passionate about. There's only so much right. that you can take, right? So, right. Um, okay, so that, I mean, this helps us think about, actually, it's a good transition a little bit in terms of when we think about what we do and how we publish and how we produce, you know, that's a publication I've, I've written about uh, in terms of scholarship. Um, I know that you, do, like me, you also use digital tools uh, as a scholarly form. So I was wondering, you know, is there, you know, in what ways for you specifically do things like digital literacy or, or uh, digital creativity uh, influence or inflect into your uh, scholarly practices? Um, well, I guess I can share my screen again as I'm talking about this. That Are we going back to Buffalo? Because that was... No, I mean, I, as much as I'd love to. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, I, I, I not only teach these things, right, as you know, but I also, I make videos as a part of my scholarly practice. You know, we, we design uh, all kinds of weird stuff. I run a journal that's digitally oriented. So, you know, for me, it's a, it's a really straightforward, but I know you've got some really interesting projects that you've been working on. Um, yeah. Your research. So, yeah, feel free to share, share with us. What do you got? What, do you, what are you making these days? Or what have you made, I should say? <laughs> so, I think the most important thing, the distinction I like to make about using um, digital technologies, digital rhetorics, all of these new, you know, kind of exciting topics in rhetoric and composition um, is for me, I'm using these tools, these platforms, these technologies to leverage conversations that I want to have. So I want to have conversations about how we remember history. So public, his, public memory and race and place. Um, these are conversations that I feel are important that we need to have, but the audience is rather limited when I'm just writing for an academic journal where five people are going to read it and maybe cite me if I'm lucky and that's about it. So if I wanna have conversations like this and I want a larger audience to be able to um, think about these ideas as well. This is where I see digital tools, you know, filling that gap for me. Um, so what you see on the screen here is a virtual reality tour. Um, it was a part of a project I did in Pendleton, South Carolina, where I lived for four years. Um, and so this is this this what you see on the screen represents. Um, a counter tour to the dominant narrative in the American South. Typically, it's about white people who have done all of these great things, which they may or may not have done, but that's not the problem. The problem is there's so many other stories um, by right. you know, individuals, people of color, um, that are just not a part of the story. So people just don't know. And so I worked with an organization in the town to create um, a counter tour that would counter the stories that um, are the dominant ones. Um, and so I felt like this was a great way to, um, to talk about some things that maybe people don't want to talk about, but also so that um, people could visualize these concepts in a spatial way. So you don't have to be in this space. You don't have to walk around to be able to see these sites, but you can click around and kind of feel like you're moving through these sites. Um, and so this is housed on my website, but that's, that's just because of the scholarship aspect, aspect of it, but it's also housed on the Pendleton Foundation for Black History and Culture. So the goal is, is that people can find out more about these issues, that they can learn more about these amazing individuals who have lived in this town. Um, in a way that they wouldn't hear about if I was just writing an article about it for you know, a journal in our field. So I feel like it's a great opportunity to kind of have these conversations um, that just wouldn't be heard and wouldn't be thought about. And so like you mentioned too, I mean, I have videos that I've made as well. You know, this is an example of that where it's you know, talking about some of these deeper the theoretical concepts that are not User friendly that are not friendly to just an audience um, that is outside of our field or outside of academia. But you can watch a video. Who doesn't like to watch a video? I mean, YouTube is huge. So, right. yeah. So, I mean, I guess I, for me, I see using these types of technologies as leverage to have conversations about important social justice related issues um, rather than just, I'm making videos because I like making videos. And that's okay to do that. Um, 
but I, I see it as just widening the scope of my uh, persuasiveness. You know, when I started working in digital tools and digital technologies, it was an attempt to demonstrate how these digital modes could enact scholarship in the same ways or similar capacities as traditional print works. Because I think there's a stigma there between, you know, what would consider to be academic critical inquiry practices and text versus all oh, the creative fun stuff you do in these other media. But in truth, you can do some really impactful and empowering work. And I know Digital Humanities has been making this push for about 15 years to create more engagement. I think really that's what's at stake is this kind of project, the VR project you've, you've done is it really finds a way to translate the theoretical kinds of things we do into real world applications for, for people in a very immediate uh, sense. Mm -hmm. um, there are still matters of access and issues when it comes to technology, but nonetheless, right. it gives a voice in a space uh, and can quite literally translate your work to people in a way that you just, it's hard to do in text, you know, so, um, particularly when you're writing for an academic journal of academic audiences uh, who expect a certain kind of language and, and approach mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it uh, can be uh, difficult, but the tools themselves give us, I think, a greater capacity to express ourselves to, to a wider range of folks. I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, project. And so I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see what you do next, because now you're in a whole new space that may have its own kind of, you know, I'm sure it has its own kind of spatial, racial. Uh, oh, I've got a project already in the yeah. world. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, Clemson in the South and, and, that's, and that space is uh, historically South uh, in a, for a variety of reasons, because South Carolina still, but they never rejoined the union or whatever. They never, you know, stopped the war as far as yeah. some folks are concerned. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, but I, so I'm sure that there's all kinds of uh, opportunities to enact the same kinds of things in Huntsville. Um, so, I mean, uh, so you have a project you're working on, is that right? You've got a thing you're trying well, to do? Well, I mean, or? very early stages. Um, yeah, I stumbled across, and not in Huntsville, so I live probably about 40 minutes south of Huntsville in the Woodlands, which is a suburb of um, Houston. And uh, just one day I was driving, actually picking up uh, a friend of my daughter's, and I stumbled across this little, I mean, this is quite literally 10 minutes from my house, this little community called Tamina. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. Just there was something about it that just resonated with me. Uh, I would call it a punctum, uh, a, a prick, a pierce. Um, and so I did a little research about this little tiny community. And you have to keep in mind that north of Houston in the Woodlands is a very upscale, you know, white kind of space you know it's just it's a place where a lot of people with money live um a lot a lot more diversity than in rural south carolina though i, I have to say but nonetheless this little community i stumbled across this little community and did a little research and found that it is um it was established in the late 1800s um a group of freed black slaves um they built it um they've lived there all and there's people that live in that community have lived there for um, four and five generations. Um, there's a lot of history there. There's a lot of stories that aren't being told and no historical markers at all in the whole area. And there's a lot of really significant sites and individuals who have lived there. Um, so it's definitely my next project. Nice, um, nice. Texas, the Texas, Texas Historical Society. I can't think of the, the proper term for it right now. They have, uh, an organization kind of under their umbrella called the Untold Markers Program or Untold Histories. I'm totally wrong with my terminology here, but <laughs> the, concept, the concept is they have this um, group, you know, where they're trying to circulate some of these individuals and stories that have been marginalized by dominant society and dominant culture. So, um, super early stages, but stay tuned. I'm really excited about partnering with this community and getting some historical marker tax place in the community. That, that's, that's amazing. That's great. I mean, you know, um, to see what, if, uh, what you want to do and your kind of work and how it might have an immediate impact is fascinating. We've been, I've been teaching a class this semester called Digital Monumentality. Um, and of course, I came to this idea too late, but one of the things that I've noticed from students is they've chosen monuments and things they're trying to look at either to rhetorically analyze or to create a digital sort of uh, representation of is there's a lot of things in and around the Bloomington Indiana community that are markers that nobody just nobody talks about they just like they're hidden in the wall it's amazing like there's a, a plaque in town where Susan B Anthony gave one of her key speeches for the suffrages movement and so you know it's uh it's it's fascinating to see uh how can we get how can we use the tools and technologies that we employ on a regular basis to sort of empower and expose and to give voice to things that may maybe otherwise haven't been able to find 
uh, a voice. So I think it's, I think it's uh, really exciting stuff. Um, with that in mind, I want to switch a little bit because I think, you know, one of the cool, uh, the really fun things about what we do is not only can we leverage new emerging media and technologies for the, the wonderful weird things that we teach and try and get students to do, um, but can we anticipate what's going to happen next, right? So, uh, you know, one of, uh, so one of my questions that I, I, I want to explore a little bit more um, for folks as they come on to these, this particular kind of video series is, you know, where do we think things are going to go? in terms of like digital literacy, digital creativity, higher education, you know, what is the space, the next space, or what are some things we should try and start anticipating either as, you know, thought leaders in this area, or more importantly, as helping the larger faculty sort of start to come to terms with the fact that most students have far more mediated experiences than non at this point, right? So, uh, you know, we have to sort of rethink maybe how we teach based on the student body who's just now different. Uh, Right. Um, and I'm different. I'm, I'm media saturated too. So it's not just them, but it's, you know, it's one of those kinds of questions. What, what, what are some things that you think are, are going to be maybe some next, next uh, points that we want to look at or consider uh, in the landscape that we're dealing with? Um, I do think that one of the most important things that we need to think about is um, the move towards more and more online classes. Um, because yeah. I mean, it's at my, my university for sure, but I mean, I saw it at Clemson as well, and I'm sure that it's happening around the country that there's an expectation now that students have the opportunity to take more classes online. Um, it works well for people who commute. It, it's just, uh, you know, it's a little bit more convenient. I mean, from our end, I'm sure that we can see pluses and minuses uh, with teaching right. online versus teaching face-to-face -face for sure. But I think we, whether we like it or not, we need to think about how we can leverage the um, digital tools that we love to use in our research and we love to use in our face-to-face -face classrooms. How can we translate those ideas into online classes um, to maybe improve the experience of taking a class online, which typically is, you know, you're clicking on folders, you're opening documents, you're reading them, and then you're spitting back information in some capacity. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying this because I feel like I've mastered it by any stretch of the imagination. I feel like I have a lot to learn. Um, I'm going to start going to more events that are going to you know, give me some more tools about how I, and tips and tricks about how I can make my online class more innovative and exciting. And um, I, I definitely don't, I mean, I try to make every class that I teach an experience that students step away from and feel like they've learned something they're there they're present they're not bored i hate i hate when i'm teaching and i can tell that people are bored I'm yeah. like, i just can't do it so i'm online, done same thing can't do it <laughs> yeah. um uh, it, it's uh you actually you pointed out something you know one of the things that we do here i, I we i rebuilt the uh, online freshman composition course here so we we took our regular freshman class and moved it online and one of the things we really focused on in that design as a project team and as a group was um not just putting the course online but to folks on building learning experiences in the online space. Mm -hmm. And so things like, you know, championing more, more and better feedback loops so that students didn't feel that disconnect of the filing cabinet education where they drop something off and take something out. And, you know, um, and so that, that's really a central component of, of how we approach it. But one of the things that I've noticed in my own teaching in the last, in more so the last three to four years than, than, than any other time is the, in my regular classes, students want more and more of the content to be put online. Like, I don't know if it's a hybrid model or it's because they've been exposed to other models where all the course content and assets and instructional materials and lectures and con whatever is also then available online. And so it's, it's fascinating to me to think about how the advent of more and more online classes and those kind of hybrid learning environments are in, in, in wonderful ways actually pushing back into traditional teaching. I mean, I think one of the great affordances, as you, you probably know at this point, as you're struggling and working through and experiencing all the fun that is the online environment, is uh, teaching online forces you to make all of your design choices as an educator overt. You have to you have to do them ahead of time. There's no like, well, on Thursday, I'm going to do something. We'll figure it out. No, you have to know like two weeks in advance, like that Thursday, this is what we're going to do. Uh, and and that that kind of thing uh, is a hurdle for a lot of faculty, uh, don't get me wrong, but it's also, I think, a really positive value to how something like a networked digital platform for learning, right, impacts what is otherwise a very traditional face-to-face -face conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, so it's just something I find, I find engaging. How do you, is there something specific that you've been trying to do in the online class? Like, what is that, like a key thing you try and hold on to when you're in the space? 
Uh, I wish I could say that I had it mastered because um, this is the first time I've taught an online class that's a semester long, not just like a quick little uh, summer's class. Right. Uh, so, I mean, one thing I did actually for the first time I used um, Premiere Rush um, because I knew I wanted to make weekly videos for students. And I realize it's still kind of the same system where it's a filing cabinet, but hey, at least they're seeing me talk about ideas and concepts. So, um, and Premiere Rush makes it so easy for me to make a video of myself. I mean, so I'm talking and then I can add other elements and it's, I mean, remarkable. If you haven't used it, use it. It makes life just, so, I mean, it, it makes video production incredibly, incredibly fast. Um, but a little bit better than Spark Video that's kind of weird and clunky at times. Um, so I have made 16 videos for 16 Ooh. weeks. Wow, And I don't believe this though. <laughs> I made them all on the same day. Wow, that's amazing. I though, just I think. was like, I'm doing it. And so I would leave my room and put on another shirt and then come back. <laughs> and your students are going to see this and they're going to be like, ah, oh, the truth is out. No, that's, that's no, amazing though. That's, can't let them know that. <laughs> that that's, uh, I mean, you know, we did a, we did a series of videos for our, our online design and of course I didn't, I didn't make them all. I only made a couple uh, and students made a lot. So it wasn't quite that thing, but to think about sitting down, designing the content of your course and being able to sit down in one day and make 16 videos, one for each week. That's, I mean, that, to me, that's, that's a core value of educational design. Like in, in before, before class begins to say, no, here are the weekly chunks Mm -hmm. um, and here's how things work. And I know it seems simple and it's probably like I'm overselling it, but so many people who teach do not do that. They don't lay out yeah. the whole class ahead of time or they'll have a skeletal structure and a calendar online, but the, really the content of the class is, um, you know, well, let's see what the students talk about and then we'll figure it out or, or let's respond to this text. And I think, I think having that kind of the forcing you to make that plan and to do that and then to have the foresight to change your shirt each week. Um, I did. I mean, at least I changed my shirt. My hair I looks the same. I mean, yeah. sometimes I like tucked it behind my ears. Oh, like, <laughs> I just put on this jacket and I put on a different jacket and then, you know. Yeah, um, I mean, the options are endless. <laughs> that's, uh, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. You know, so one of the things that I do in all my classes uh, and I have since, I think I taught my first online class at Clemson in 2000 and seven so it's you know and i taught off and on and online for ever since then mm -hmm. um uh, i haven't taught online now in a couple of years here but it's probably coming back in my circle uh the um is i i i so much of what makes me work in a classroom is me being me right and being able to respond in sort of real time to students and read yeah. them like you said when they're bored i can see that and you know mm -hmm. i come with activities and i come with a backup plan in case those don't work mm -hmm. uh, and the online the first time i taught that it really felt like it stripped all that away like it took all of me out of the space and so I use all the tools and technologies that I can to bring me back in. The videos, are, I do that as well. I do post-class discussions where I post things in, uh, in video form. I use audio and video for my feedback for students to, mm -hmm. the more and more I can make connections with them, the better. And then I actually require once a week online synchronous meetings. So in, in the program like Zoom, like we're using today, um, which is really excellent for that. Uh, you can't quite have a full 25 person discussion, but um, mm -hmm. you know, it's not impossible. So, but those are always my like key things. And, and I think the more we can find ways to bring media uh, and these sort of tools into that space, the more we can craft a meaningful mediated experience for students. And that's really sort of what the heart is of what I've been trying to do with the online space. Now, I'm not sure that's true for everyone else. Uh, it may be an outlier and it may not make sense in the long run, but uh, for now, that's, those are my, my like, here's mm -hmm. what I'm doing now. And I think here's where it's gonna go. It's gonna be more and more of that kind of uh, experiential model of learning in an online space rather than a, mm -hmm. a, just a simple content exchange, right? Right. Not that, it's, not that it's ever just a simple content exchange. I don't want yeah. to be productive, but uh -huh. I mean, you know, you learn a set of theories, you read about them, you apply them, you demonstrate the knowledge. And then, um, you know, I have so many classes that you can take online without ever having met the instructor. Uh, yeah. which is, I don't like that. I know they work, but you know, as a, I don't know, as a writing teacher, that's hard for me because what we teach is process and skill development and um, I'm thinking development. So it's not quite a the same thing. So, yeah. um, so those are, you know, I think that that sort of brings us to about the end of the, of the show today. Uh, the question, I guess the last question for you would be what are, what can we promote? What can we plug for you? What can we share with the world? Uh, I know you have this, this great new project that's in its infancy stages and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll wait to see what comes out <laughs> of that. Um, you know, I know you got articles and things you're working on, but what is your, what is your next leap? Uh, or what is the next thing that you would like people to know? Uh, in terms of what you're doing or where can we point them? 
Um, well, I mean, it's I, I, some of the things I just showed on the screen earlier, um, there's a couple of publications that are, one is forthcoming, one is in the works, um, kind of working on revising that right now. Um, so you can definitely be on the lookout for that. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of always doing a million things at the same time. I have a couple, like a couple of book projects. I know that sounds nuts, but I'm working on a co-written project with a colleague. And then I have some ideas about, or, you know, a monograph. So I'm, there's a lot that's happening in this brain here and I'm looking forward <laughs> to putting that's it up. Yeah. That's better than nothing happening. Right. Yeah. In the, in the brain. <laughs> um, and so, no, that's awesome. Uh, well, Daniel, I will be sure to, to send everyone to your website. Uh, it's aprilobrien.net, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we'll keep an eye out for all of your uh, wonderful things to be forthcoming in, in the years to come. Um, with that said, I, I appreciate you taking the time to be on the show today. I think, you know, it's a good start uh, for our first series. And if it's not a good start, I'll get to blame it all on you. So there's that. Yes, and we can just right? make switch it around and let someone else go first. Well, I, well, look. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're the, you're the, no, this uh, is episode two. <laughs> Yeah, the first one is just me talking to myself. It did not get good reviewer ratings. It's okay. So, uh, uh, but yeah, no, thanks for coming on today. Uh, hopefully, you know, in the future, you'll be able to have all these things on, done and we can bring you back and you can share uh, some of the new work or as you invent a whole new way of doing online education, we can bring ah, you yes. back to talk mm -hmm. about the, the April O'Brien model for online <laughs> delivery. Uh, it's going to be exciting stuff. I hope I get rich off of that. Well, you know, it's got to be at least worth five or six dollars. So it's going to yeah, be, yeah. be amazing. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you so much for coming in today and we appreciate your time. Yep. See you later.